Welcome to Beyond the Block, a Web3 focused podcast where in each episode we'll explore a topic impacting our industry. Joined by an esteemed industry colleague, we'll dive deep into how it's driving our businesses. This is, of course, all powered by Kadena, the only truly scalable layer one proof of work blockchain. Let's dive in. All right, well, welcome to Beyond the Block, episode two. Today we're going to be uh, talking about ZK, joined by our special guest here, John Burnham from Lurk Labs. And Lurk ha- uh, John has a great deal of experience with ZK, so I'm hoping to learn a lot of uh, some neat ideas and also where the future we might be going with ZK. So to get this all started, how about I ask for a little intro? John, who are you and what got you interested in ZK? Thanks, John. Yeah, so I, I've been working on ZK for the past few years now. Uh, it really started in, in 2021 with ZK, but I've been in blockchain uh, as a software engineer founder uh, since 2012, I think was my first blockchain project. I did a, did a you know, project with Bitcoin that didn't really go anywhere, but uh, then worked on, on some, some interesting things in the early days of Ethereum. Um, and uh, worked on Tezos, uh, really focused on, on uh, formal verification, functional programming. Uh, and that's kind of how I got into uh, zero knowledge proofs because in uh, 2021, I met with uh, uh, Chime Kunzang, who is now my, my co founder at the time. He had just finished up helping to launch Filecoin, uh, which is still the largest ZK um, uh, platform in the world, you know, in terms of the size of its circuit. Um, and uh, he told me about this functional programming language that he was uh, developing called Lurk, um, which is a Lisp-based language that can create uh, zero-knowledge proofs of its own execution. Um, and what that means is that if I run a Lurk program, I can make like a really tiny uh, artifact. I can send you. I can create a small certificate and send it to you and show you that this was the certified output of uh, the program that I that I ran without you having to rerun it. So. Um, that blew my mind uh, as someone that had been, you know, building functional languages, uh, you know, Haskell, OCaml, um, for for a while, um, and um, and because of the things that I've been doing on on blockchain, I sort of immediately connected that that, that was going to be how we were going to get out of of the uh, blockchain scaling quagmire that uh, we've basically been fighting through as a, an industry for a very long time. So. Um, yeah, and so uh, we uh, then had you know a lot of lot of adventures, but so we ended up you know uh, having uh, you know the team at at uh, Protocol Labs nucleated out of Protocol Labs, merged with a team that I had the, called Yatima that was doing doing some formal verification stuff, um, and now we have Lurk Lab, so we have a team of of uh, eleven engineers uh, building uh, what we uh, intend to be the best zero knowledge uh, cryptography stack uh, in the world. Uh, mm. We hope. Oh, thank you very much. You know, if I were if I were to try and explain uh, zk in the simplest terms, I think something you and I have discussed in the past is that it is it is a way of offering assurance without comprehension. Like, say yes. I've done some really difficult, hard thing, and as a result of that work, I have some answer for you, and I want to hand you that answer. Well, in the traditional world, without zk, in order for you to know that that answer really came from the work that I did you would have to do that work too. But ZK is a way to get a certificate that says not only what the answer is, but also where the answer came from. And like if you look at blockchains especially, they establish consensus <clears throat> by having all of the different n- nodes in the, in the network all be doing the same work. So where, one reason that I became very interested in ZK is because some of my background is also from formal methods, so I'm very interested in the power of proof and its expressivity. And it just seems that if you're doing all of this work over and over and over again, ZK is a way to lever your capability. It's a, it's a way to, in fact, not only stop all that replicated work, but also introduce the capacity to do work that is beyond the capability of the nodes in your network today. So you might have... 100 regular PCs running as nodes in the network, and then one supercomputer. Uh, you know, in my day, I would have called that a cray. I don't know what the, the current day supercomputer is. But let's say the supercomputer is some giant AI network, and it does something that no one else can understand or has the, even the compute power to repeat. Yet ZK allows that information to be transmitted across the channel uh, with complete assurance of how it was created. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah that's well, exactly well, right. How would you how would you in brief talk about uh, ZK to people who don't know about it? Yeah, so so the way that that I think about it, uh, I think that the right the right um, the right way to abstract a black box ZK without going into details around around circuits and polynomials and uh, finite fields and elliptic curves, which are really details that I think you don't need to know to understand what ZK is for, um, is that ZK allows you to do something really counterintuitive, which is to uh, check someone else's work without redoing their work. Mm -hmm. So if you think of like a, 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 a math professor, like grading like a problem set, right? Like, well, how, how does the math professor know that you, that you did some calculation? He's, you've got to show your work, right? You've always got to show your work in, in, in math class. But ZK, the whole point of ZK is that uh, I can, there is a, a way, there's almost like, it's almost like a loophole in math <laughs> where we can, comp we can construct a probabilistic argument. We can, we can construct a really weird mathematical object that convinces you th not like of the process that I went through to get the right answer, but just convinces you of the, the, the raw fact that it's, very unlikely that I could have created this artifact without doing the work to get to the right answer. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, the, and the way it works is very beautiful. It's very fascinating. Uh, I, I really encourage anyone who's interested in it to, 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 try, to try to grapple with. But it's a little bit like quantum mechanics, right? It's sort of like a, it, it's, a, it's an arcane thing. Uh, an arcane magic that underlies a lot of really useful stuff, and but you don't really have to know, you know, like the the wave function and the Schrodinger equation to like appreciate, you know, that oh, semiconductors are really useful, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where where I see ZK as. But I think your 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 the formulation that 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 uh, you mentioned uh, to me the other day that you were you know repeated here is that uh, the separation of of assurance from comprehension, like that's that's the key of it. It's I don't have to understand what you're doing. I don't have to go through all the steps that you went through. I don't have to to check that like each like line of your your you know set of calculations was right. Um, I can have assurance that you, that you know the, the the that the bottom line is is right um, through like this weird you know this weird thing this this magic moon math uh, sometimes <laughs> people call it in the in the industry. And what do you, what would you say is the significance of zk to the world of crypto and and the world of blockchain? Oh yeah, absolutely. So so uh, it's it's enormous because one of the, the the point of of crypto, like going going all the way back to to Bitcoin, is that we are also trying to get assurance, right? That's the the like in in like the original Bitcoin paper right like we, Nakamoto consensus the process that's described is how do we know that these transactions are the right transactions how do I know like like if we have these balances or these UTXOs you know in Bitcoin but basically like if we have this state of of the world and there's new transactions how do we know that those transactions are valid mm -hmm. um, and then Bitcoin has Bitcoin script and so there's a limited ability to do some kinds of computation within Bitcoin Ethereum has like has a much broader ability to do computation but so but the way that that traditionally blockchains work um, is using a replicated state machine so we get assurance because we have this this cloud of people. Uh, if we think about sort of like the math homework, we're all doing the same math homework, right? And we're all rechecking everyone else's work, right? Um, and if anyone says that, you know, two plus two is anything other than four, you know, we, we point at them and we say, no, that's a bad transaction. I don't accept it. I'm not including it into, into my view of the world. Um, yeah. And... And then we have a crypto economic layer that makes it expensive for people to lie and for people to, to make things up, to have bad transactions. So that, that's really what blockchains are. It's, it's, um, it's uh, replicated state machines, which, which you can, you know, that's a, a technology that's used for, for, you know, a million other things. It has, it's not, that's not core to, to, to blockchain. But what blockchains are is the replicated state machine plus a crypto economic layer so that we get, we get some, some practical guarantees around uh, correctness. We don't have to trust um, you know, that the people in the network are, are honest people or good people. We just have to trust that they're economically rational. Um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and so the, but the impact of, of zero knowledge is that like, the, the point of, of, of blockchains is to, is to get assurance. Um, 
but the only way to get assurance historically has been to actually have comprehension of all the, cal the, the computations that are happening um, you know, with respect to this state. Like in order to get the new state and to agree, have everyone agree on it, to go from state A to state B, we have everyone in the network, all like 100,000 nodes in the Ethereum network, however many nodes, full nodes there are now, uh, have to compute that same function. So if you think about it, every single block all 100,000 nodes have to update the state of every single contract. And this is why Ethereum is so expensive, mm -hmm. um, among other reasons. I mean, there's a lot of reasons. But th this is the core reason why it's expensive, um, is that we take, like, you know, when you, when you have, like, a, a, a smart contract that adds, you know, 2 plus 2 is 4, you're not adding 2 plus 2 and getting 4 once. You're commanding the swarm of, of Ethereum uh, validators to calculate 2 plus 2 is 4. And they all have to do that work. Mm -hmm. What zero knowledge does is it lets us say, okay, we actually don't, n we don't need to do that. We can, we can have a single prover generate a, uh, a succinct proof. It doesn't have to be zero knowledge, but uh, zero knowledge is a, uh, the ZK snark stands for zero knowledge, succinct, uh, non-interactive argument of knowledge. So succinctness is, is really in some sense the more important property, but we say zero knowledge because zero knowledge and succinctness are, are very uh, related to one another. Um, and, and what is succinctness uh, specifically? Yeah. So succinctness is this this uh, is the idea of like it doesn't ma matter how big the computation that I'm trying to prove is. I, I get a small proof artifact, mm -hmm. even with a really so if I if I run a, a computation for a year, um, it, it it's still producing a proof artifact that you can verify in you know milliseconds. Mm -hmm. um, 10 years, still milliseconds. It, it, the, the so succinctness just means that the size of the verification operation um, doesn't scale fast with respect to the um, size of the, the thing that you're, you're uh, uh, trying to prove. So, um, okay, but this is where we get to, like, what the relevance is. Because, like, the replicated state machine, we care about, like, arriving at new states. Um, Zero-knowledge proofs allow us to... Ha to, to sort of um, front load the work onto a prover and then verification is really cheap. So mm -hmm. what's, what people are really excited about, it, in, and this is really part of you know, what, what's called Ethereum's ZK-centric future. This is like a, a term that they use all the time. And, and, and I'm referencing Ethereum a lot because it's you know, the biggest chain and it's a, a, you know, a, big, a lot of the ZK stuff is happening in the, in the context of Ethereum. Um, is that uh, the, the idea is that instead of the validators um, computing new states, the validators will just be verifying proofs that new states are correct mm -hmm. according to some, you know, commit. So if I uh, committed, like, you know, logic. So if I have a uh, smart contract, uh, I'm not going to have the logic of my smart, smart contract in, like, Solidity necessarily running on um, – running on all these nodes, maybe I have my, uh, my smart contract is actually a commitment to like a Cairo program and then, on, and then I'm using, you know, StarkNet. Uh, uh, and then StarkNet is landing zero knowledge proofs on Ethereum. So StarkNet is a layer two scaling solution. There are others, Polygon uh, is, is one, uh, ZK Sync uh, is one. There are, there are a whole bunch of really exciting things happening uh, in this space. And so, um, yeah, uh, I think that, that uh, ZK is uh, the future of blockchain because it, it's a real technical solution to like this core problem of, of, of uh, blockchain scaling in a, in a different dimension um, of the design space than what people have been doing for the past 10 years of like, okay, well, if we just, you know, Arrange our, uh, you know, our the block topology in in a particular way. If we, you know, um, you know, have the 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 the, the headers formatted just so, and we, we like, there's a lot of work that's happened on trying to, you know, lay, like design consensus algorithms. And I think, you know, Cadena represents, I think, you know, a really interesting sort of extreme of of how you can of like how much you can get out of this. Mm -hmm. But what's what's cool is that ZK is a completely different like. It's completely orthogonal to this. So yeah, yeah. now we can, we can, we have like, it's like a new tool. It's a new toy we can play with to try to, you know, make blockchains really useful and really, really scalable. So if I were to summarize, what I hear you saying is that the new magic sauce that ZK is bringing to crypto and blockchain is this asymmetry. 
that proof production and proof verification are now so different in their time scales that you locally can have a super powerful computer that can spend days and days and days producing a proof. But because of succinctness, you will get a very small proof as a result of those several days of computation. And the verification of that proof is a mere matter of seconds. And yes. then every other node in the network, hundreds of thousands of other machines, by doing that few seconds of verification, they are in effect replicating the knowledge they would have gotten from doing those several days of computation yes. that you did. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And, and um, it, well, the knowledge of the result. And so the, this is where zero knowledge and succinctness are important because um, zero knowledge means, uh, the, the technical meaning of it is that the verifier gains zero additional knowledge um, about the, the claim, about the computation, other than the result. So, mm -hmm. so it's like I give you this proof artifact and I, and I give you this claim, you know, that, that, you know, two plus two is four, right? And you verify it and you don't learn anything else about like, how did I do two plus two is four? Did I add, did I, did I break it down into, you know, one plus one plus one? Did I do it in binary or what? Mm -hmm. uh, and with a larger computation, there would be m many more steps. Um, and so uh, the, the zero knowledge aspect is, um, is really connected to privacy because then you, you can have, um, you know, these very, like, long-running or, or detailed, like, internal computations, and then only send the result out to, to verifiers on the network. Um, so, uh, yes, but this is, that's, that's the core value add, um, is being able to, to never have to redo computations. Right. And you know that privacy aspect you mentioned is interesting, because one, one example I've thought of in the past is that uh, my property taxes, right? In order for me to pay property taxes, it's, it's based on a lot of factors that are local to me. Where my house is, uh, how large my house is, location. A lot of details that are very, very personal and private to me. But I have to give all of those details to the state of California so that they can run right. their math and find out what the amount is and then send me that amount. Right. But with ZK, it sounds like what I could do is if they were to give me their procedure for computing the taxes based on my address and all the other factors, I could do that calculation with my private data, give them, tell them what the amount is that I owe them, plus this certificate that says I right. used your procedure. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, I think that, that um, ironically, in uh, such a uh, you know, cypherpunk and narco-capitalist uh, uh, field that we have, uh, one of the great applications of zero knowledge is the streamlining of bureaucracy uh, because yeah because it 's like a really powerful tool for for uh, you know, for to aggregate like information about standards so one thing that I think the, a, a concrete application of the, of the example that you gave um, that I have thought about you know a lot because it 's very connected to the work that that i 've done on, on on formal verification is um, you know, people talk about like blockchain regulation, right? And because there's a lot of, there are bad actors in, in, in blockchain, you know, there are rug pulls, there are people that have smart contracts that say they do one thing and really, you know, do something different. Um, and uh, the, the sort of, there are a lot of people that notice this and say, oh, well, the answer is, is that, that we need the SEC to come in and regulate. We need to have a, mm. a centralized, you know, 20th century style bureaucracy to like make rules and you know we'll have you know court cases and administrative law and, you know all this all this apparatus right that's you know really designed for like you know uh, factories you know making widgets right and uh, you know Tammany Hall or or whatever if I'm if I'm being cynical but like the the um, but the thing that we can do actually is a, with 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 ZK is something even better than that because we can say okay well let's say there are standards for smart contracts let's say that we have like so we have like ERC20 is like a smart contract standard mm -hmm. if we created a um, a formal model of what an ERC20 contract is and there there are some that exist but if we we if we took one of them what we could do is we could say okay well i have now i have my smart contract application that I'm deploying. And I want to prove that this smart contract application really is like an ERC-20 or is, you know, follows like, you know, the, the following 10, you know, 
uh, standards, industry standards, you know, maybe government standards. Um, and, and I want to show that, that like, really, like I've, 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 uh, I've done, I'm, I'm a, I'm a good, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, positive sum, you know, thinking person. I, I want to, I want to, you know, provide value for my customers. I'm not trying to do anything, uh, nefarious and I want people to have confidence in, in the, te in the, the products and the technologies that I'm making. So what you can do is you can say, okay, I'm going to take these standards, um, these formal models. I'm going to do the computation that, um, uh, with my contract as input, right, that verifies th through those models that, that, you know, it really is like an ERC-20. It really is a, a, a verified whatever uh, contract. And then I can c compress that computation into a zero-knowledge proof and land that on chain. So now anyone interacting with that contract can, mm. you know, in, in a matter of, of milliseconds, can very cheaply verify that, that my contract really does have these like beneficial safety and security properties. They don't have to go and find um, my source code. They don't mm -hmm. have to read the formal model. They don't have to know what a formal model is. It's like the equivalent of you know an, of an underwriter's laboratory's uh, right, uh, right. stamp, right? A certification right. that you've obeyed the standard. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And I think this is how we regulate the blockchain industry. We. It, it's not. Um, that that we have the government you know come in and you know bless contracts sort of one by one maybe there will be some broad rules but i think that zk is going to allow for a really powerful um dynamic of of self-regulation and companies regulate because what uh, it, it's and i think where we end up is something like what we have right now on the internet with um https and uh you know, ssl certificates right most internet users have no idea, you know, what HTTPS is. They don't know what what an SSL certificate is. If you ask them to describe like a, a certificate authority, or you ask them what is VeriSign, like no one knows. Like it, it, it's it, and they don't really need to know because at the top of this this pyramid of like very like complicated uh, infrastructure and cryptography and institutions, we have a single binary signal, which is the lock symbol in your browser and what people do know is that if i have the lock symbol it's okay to enter my credit card information right, and if right. i have the lock symbol with the red line it's not okay to enter my credit card information <laughs> so we've we've done exactly this we've we've taken one part of of uh security on the the internet and we've constructed a reliable signal for assurance, for security assurance, without requiring comprehension. Now, mm. the difference is, is that this is a very trusted system. Yeah. You, you yeah. do have to trust these certificate authorities. In ZK, you don't have those same trust assumptions. Mm. I see. So already we've discussed uh, eliminating redundancy of com computation. We've discussed the asymmetry of compute power that this allows. We've talked about privacy. We've talked about self-regulation. I mean, it's sort of, sort of starting to sound like ZK is this magical, uh, magical potion that you can apply to solve so many different things. But I know that Lurk Labs has been even thinking beyond this. You, you have some ideas for where ZK could take us uh, in the next realm. And to, to the listeners, I would like to, I'm very happy to say that starting in 2024, actually, Cadena and Lurk Labs, we've signed a partnership agreement where we're going to be working together on these ZK technologies, which allows Cadena to sort of be a, a breeding ground for some of these newer ideas that, that you have in mind. But could you say a little more about where else do you think ZK can go in the future? Yeah, so... Uh, I do think it's a it's a it's a magic potion. I, I think of it as a programming superpower, right? Uh, occasionally in the history of computing, we've developed new ideas, right, collectively that uh, are just so useful that we just don't know. We can't imagine doing without them. Like compilers, for example. Mm -hmm. Like at one point, compilers were a controversial technology, right? Like uh, von Neumann, right, famously was like, "Why are you wasting valuable computing time, right, when you could just be writing assembly?" Right, mm -hmm. so uh, hash functions, public key cryptography. It's it's just impossible to imagine how we could do commerce on the internet without without those things. And mm -hmm. I think that zk is uh, in that category of uh, transformative innovation. Um, and uh, there are a lot of applications in in uh, blockchain. Um, I think that the applications of blockchain are sort of the earliest because that's where this problem of assurance is greatest. 
uh, but it's by no means limited there. So one of the things that, that people have talked about uh, that is now really important um, is data integrity uh, with respect to um, – uh, you know, a world where with ubiquitous and cheap generative uh, AI. So uh, how do I know that a photo published in uh, the New York Times is a real photo, right? And, and uh, that's, uh, that's an important thing to be able to know because, you know, people are making policy decisions and people are voting based on, you know, what they read, you know, in, the, in you know, the, the papers or, you know, online. Uh, we, if people can just make like fake images to drive a certain narrative or propaganda, like that's that's like that's kind of a scary a scary thing. We want to be able to trust that the information that we have is real. So one application of zk that that um, is pretty interesting is that there are there's a way to have uh, hardware generate zero knowledge proofs that this particular image was taken at a specific time with this hardware and for that and we know that this hardware is genuine because it's got a, a, a private key and so there are things that you can do to um, to make it more difficult to to fake these different kinds of, of interesting of, well so this takes ZK into an area we haven't discussed yet which is provenance right and how, how, how exactly does ZK establish provenance in the context yeah. of a hardware device? Yeah, so so the um, so there are already techniques for provenance for for hardware provenance. Um, you know, you you can have like when you have like a camera produce an image, like the image has a hash, right? And um, the uh, so there are already ways to get like signatures, right? And mm -hmm. and you know there are, there's there's criticism those signatures can be faked, but it's generally harder to fake like a hardware signature than you know to just like make up a new uh, you know. Um, uh, image, right? Mm -hmm. Like it, it increases the cost of, 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 um, you know, forgery by, by a lot. And this is kind of like what the, the principle, the, the principle behind Worldcoin is, you know, there it's like, you know, scanning your iris to try to, mm -hmm. try, yeah. right, right. but, but, um, but what ZK allows you to do, um, the, the limitation with a lot of those, those, uh, techniques is that like, well, oftentimes you want to edit or crop or manipulate images, mm -hmm. um, and at that point, like the hash is different, and now how do you know that like this sequence of transformations that you've done uh, on I this see. image, right, is right. like uh, still like how do you establish chain of custody through valid computational processes? And so that's what zk is for, because zk says, okay, well I have this original uh, this originating certificate, you know, from like my 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 Canon camera, right, um, and then I'm going to crop it. I'm going to do these different, you know modifications to it and then the image that's showing up on your phone right will have like you know the the original certificate plus a zero knowledge proof that yes all of the other thing transformations that happened were you know legit according to to some you know some criterion mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and um and so i think that's, that this is really important because like the we're we're entering a world in which um Generative AI is so good. I mean, I don't know if, if you've you, you you've seen the the most recent Mid Journey, um, you know mm, stuff, no, but it's yet. it's it's really remarkable. I think that you know in in a year or two we're gonna be we're gonna be uh, you, we'll have generative AI that's that's able to to uh, you know act sort of like a like a three D game engine and just create like you know photorealistic immersive virtual worlds. So we kind of have this problem of like well. Lying is really cheap now. Making stuff up, right? And so, how do we ground? How do we ground ourselves back in reality, right? And I think that that proofs is how we do that because proofs um, is uh, that that's a way for us to to like establish that whatever information that I have, like it really did originate with something real and physical at at one point. And I think blockchain also has a has a role to play with with publishing those those uh, uh, you know. Provenance uh, certificates, uh, hosting a lot of that data, um, but then we also get. There's a lot of other really interesting applications around AI that we we think about uh, a lot, and I think that you know you know so we we don't really see ourselves as a blockchain company, um, even though you know that's that's we we started within you know mm -hmm. uh, protocol labs and we've been working on blockchains a lot. We we um, we really see zk as as a broader category than that. Um, and one of the things that we're, we're really excited about is, is this thing called ZKML. Um, 
and and we're not the only people doing this. There are a lot of people doing doing zkml, uh, but it's zero knowledge machine learning, and what that is is it's creating zero knowledge proofs ab about the outputs of uh, machine learning models, and mm -hmm. uh, it's very early days for the field. The models that you can, it's very expensive to create these proofs. We're, we're nowhere near being able to like create proofs of like, you know, GPT-3, for example. Um, mm -hmm. But we can, but there's, there's some examples of companies that, that have made like, you know, um, your trading engines that uh, neural, small neural network trading engines that can create zero knowledge proofs uh, of their own oh. uh, of their execution, and so and then can therefore trade like on Uniswap, right? Because you they can publish those proofs, um, mm. you know, through Starknet onto uh, onto Ethereum and do various things. It's, it's really cool, um, but. What, uh, but so what ZK will let us do is on the one hand, right, we're going to have techniques for being able to, to certify that uh, data, uh, that images of the, the, like of the real world are images of the real world. And we're, we're also going to have the ability to certify that images that are generated uh, by an AI are in fact generated by an AI and specifically what's, which AI are they mm -hmm. generated by? Like mm -hmm. what's the hash of the model weights? Right, that right. generated um, this, uh, and and what was the training data that was used to 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 create those model weights, and what are the various alignment and safety properties? So everything that I just I just you know talked about about like the um, the smart contract standards. Well, I mean, all of that applies to AI, right? right, right. We'll have AI and standards. And then you can show that you hadn't violated copyright by including right. some image source that you say you didn't include. Right. Right, or like constitutional AI, where you have like you know one uh, model that's that's checking all the outputs of another model to make sure they they meet some you know some you know English language you know set of principles. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's a lot of of a lot of really cool work being done in that area. But what Z zk will let us do is it will let us um, uh, succinctly and efficiently communicate all of that um, uh, verification, safety, alignment work that's happening in AI. And what we'll end up with is a world where, you know, um, the, the norm will be if I publish something, like whether it's like a tweet or, you know, an image on Instagram or whatever, I'm either going to attach a proof that, I, that I, I generated this, you know, myself, I wrote the tweet myself, or I, um, um, I uh, took a, p a picture of the real world or whatever, um, or I'm going to have a proof that, that this was made by a large language model. And the only images that won't have proofs are people that are trying to pass off something that's a, fra that was generated by an AI as something, as, as something else, right? Uh -huh. so, and you know, this hints at something you have mentioned to me in the past where AI, ZK, and blockchain all intersect. Yes. And could you, could you say a little bit more about how that all comes together? Yeah, well, yeah, with pleasure. So, so this is really cool because, like, if we imagine that that um, an AI can, like, a large language model can create, um, uh, that we can create proofs, zero knowledge proofs of, like, let's say, like, you know, uh, I don't know, let's say GP, GPT, you know, six or or, G, or seven <laughs> when it comes out, right? Like, you know, when when we have sort of an AGI scale model, um, how how are those models? going to economically interact with the rest of the world, right? Like, right now, if you, if the only real way to do that is you have to have, like, a centralized entity. Like, you can, you, there are lots of companies that, that are springing up that have, you know, APIs, and you can interact with these models, and you can have, you know, uh, pipelines that you can put together. But basically, the way that you have to do it is, like, through Stripe, right? Mm -hmm. You set up a new AI uh, startup, right? You make your Stripe account, you put up your, your you know, uh, your HTTP API and people call it and, you know, all your classic sort of web to like, that's, yeah, that's sort of credit cards at the end right, of the day. Right. Exactly. And, and, you know, and, and, and really good business for Stripe. Like, I mean, this is why Stripe is such a valuable company because they are basically charging like a 3% tax on the entire GDP of the internet. Right? Um, right, for mediating these payments, and this is why there's there. I, I love Stripe as a company. This is why their slogan is "Increase the GDP of the internet," and then you know the 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 the, the uh, unspoken part is so we can tax it, right? <laughs> right. So um, and so what? But what, what blockchain will let what will let people will let these these AI models do is it will allow people to transact with these models. Um, 
trustlessly, decentrally, uh, without uh, re requiring going through these like existing payment rails, and mm -hmm. um, and specifically, we can we can imagine mm -hmm. like okay, well, let's say I want to have um, you know GPT seven or whatever um, give me some tokens, some some output right from a particular a particular input. Well, I can uh, in the future I'll be able to create a zero knowledge uh, or, or create a claim for for this. I'll say this is the computation that I want. I want mm -hmm. and this is the result that I want. And I will give a hundred uh, cryptocurrency tokens, you know, Ethereum, Cadena tokens, whatever, to whoever fills this request. And I don't care who fills the request because they're gonna give me a proof that they've done they've that they've done this correctly. They've run, sure. you know, GPT seven on their uh, on their uh, you know future version of the H100 or, or whatever. They have some compute capability. Um, and then they will trustlessly claim those tokens. And so there will be mm -hmm. no actual, you know, one-on-one um, -on -one interaction between the, the, um, the generator and the, uh, the, the recipient, right? The proof or, is the authorization. The proof is the, the authorization. And the proof is the authorization um, uh, to, to um, take those, those tokens out of escrow and to and to actually um, you know send them to um, uh, you know to the person claiming this bounty so, right mm -hmm. and this is a general um, uh, technology for th this idea of, of zero knowledge uh, marketplaces um, is something that people are going to use for for AI for you know uh, transacting about about uh, data and software because it allows us to the, to then you know trustlessly have like you know buyers and sellers communicate using prices about like these you know different kinds of 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 you know computational objects um, without you know needing to have um, you know payment rails or you know like like uh, you know um, uh, you know conflict resolution like adjudication it's it's i, I it's going to be a very i mean and this is a low level system that that the other high, higher level systems will be built on top of so you're not just going to like have something like the future equivalent of like upwork you know just directly trading on this there might be some additional infrastructure but like that's going to be a core thing um and ais are going to be interacting with that directly because like the ability to have zero knowledge proofs of an ai's output is the equivalent of being able to give an AI, an unforgeable content uh, addressed private key, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. It gives like the, 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 a, the AI's cryptographic personhood in a sense, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, right? Because like, like this, because uh, the, then it doesn't, it, it doesn't matter who is actually running the computation. Um, the, the, uh, from the perspective of the rest of the world, you know, uh, the the AI does a little. There, there's a little bit of compute happening, you know, on uh, server A. There's a little bit of compute happening on server B. But as long as everything is referencing back to some shared state mediated through the blockchain, for the, for, sure. from the rest of the world, everyone else will perceive like continuity, right? Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's that. I think that I think is really exciting. And so there's this this. Um, uh, merging or or really like tightening interrelationship between um zero knowledge uh, cryptography uh blockchain ai and formal verification um and i think it's all kind of coming together and and there's a, there's a shape of the future that that's starting to emerge and it's really <laughs> exciting well if i can throw one more into the mix which i i think i know you're already quite excited about which is programming languages themselves you know, these blockchains yeah. are mediated by smart contracts, but a lot, of lang a lot of blockchains, Ethereum is one of them, there's a language that people use for writing these contracts, Solidity. They compile that down to EVM bytecode, and it's the EVM bytecode that the, the chain executes. Right. So there's always the question, where did the EVM bytecode I'm executing come from? You know, right. there's a provenance question of how do I know which Solidity generated this EVM bytecode? And right. in one sense, it doesn't matter, but in another sense, for auditors, it very much does matter. You right. want to know, how can I get to the source code of what produced this bytecode? And then when there are a lot of bugs in the code because of type checking problems or other issues, you want to add like a type checking layer. But yeah. you don't want to have to do the type checking on chain because that just increases the cost of the execution. However, you would like to know that what you're executing is the result of a type, type correct contract. Yeah. 
Yes. And beyond type checking, there's even more. There's formal analysis, there's yes. state model checking, there's uh, formal proofs that might be done where the proofs can take hours to execute. So there's almost like this hierarchy of information assurance yes. that gets boiled down to a bytecode where the bytecode has none of that information remaining by the time you get there. And so anyone who wants to go swim upstream to find out where did that bytecode come from and did it come from a fully correct chain of, of steps, ZK sort of gives us a way to have our cake and eat it too. Uh, so could you say a little bit more about how ZK would play into a PL smart contract world like that? Yeah, yeah. So this is this is the the area of of application that I know uh, most deeply um, because I'm I'm a, a programming languages uh, engineer by um, by trade. Um, you know, I I I'm not a, really a cryptographer. I, I know I know you know enough to to be to be uh, you know uh, dangerous, um, <laughs> but um, I yeah. So uh, with um, let me explain how we do at sort of a high level, like how programming languages like um, work in the sense of, or how they they um, represent another example of this kind of assurance through replicated state machines, right? Uh, and so, and so we're we're all living in the shadow of uh, Ken Thompson uh, and his Turing Award lecture, uh, Reflections on Trusting Trust. Right, so which is really famous. Uh, I mean, uh, at least among programming uh, language people, uh, because um, what this showed this is about compilers, right? So, mm -hmm. so what uh, Ken Thompson showed is that there are particular kinds of attacks on software that you can construct if you can compromise compiler infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, and so, in this talk, what he what he goes through is some examples around um, if I can give you like a corrupted version of of GCC of, of or, or just the C compiler. I don't even know if it was GCC at the time, but like of the C compiler um, that like recognizes certain um, uh, you know types of code as like dealing with like passwords or secrets. Um, I can then like have the compiler um, corrupt those pieces of code such that anytime your user, you know, if you're the developer, enters in a password, it exfiltrates a copy and sends it to me, right? Mm -hmm. And the sneaky thing about this is that because compilers are generally compiled by themselves, right? Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. like this is the the practice of like you know we 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 get programming languages to a point of of viability by bootstrapping them, you know, uh, by writing them in themselves and then bootstrapping, right? So so mm -hmm. compiler version zero, right, is written in some base language, right? But then once we write that, we re we write like a new comp the compiler again in version zero, and then we use the compiler version zero to compile version one to compile version two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it turns out there are some really like nefarious attacks here. Um, if you can corrupt the programming, uh, the compilation infrastructure, um, you, can, you, you can own everything that is downstream of that. Um, and um, so as a result of that, what we do in uh, programming languages is uh, we are very paranoid about the compiler binaries that we, we run. There's a lot of work done on, on you know, people. It, this is why no one trusts proprietary uh, compilers, by the way, mm -hmm. and what, why everyone, you know, you have to recompile. And this doesn't fully solve it, solve the trusting trust, you know, but it, it sort of narrows the window of, like, attacks. And then the other thing that, that happens is that n no one, when, when you write new software, um, like, if I'm writing, like, a, a, a Rust program, Right, I, I don't just like download binaries mm -hmm. from Cargo, mm -hmm. right? I download I download the actual Rust source files from right. Cargo, and then I locally comp recompile all of the, the my things with a version of the compiler that I feel good about. You know that it's not you know uh, you know Ken Thompson. It's, it doesn't have yeah, a, yeah. <laughs> a reflection attack, um, uh, and. Um, the so and so, but this is this is a replicated state machine, right? Because mm -hmm. all software, all software development, you know, recompiles everything every time we make any changes to like at the at sort of the leaves, right? Mm -hmm. We always recompile from from the root uh, outwards, right? So right. It, every git git commit, right? I'm recompiling like you know, Acme lib, right? Mm -hmm. That someone else wrote, like. 
five years ago. I'm recompiling right. it again. And okay, if, if my compiler is smart, right? Like I have some caching, right? Like I can save some work. But logically, right? Like I'm just redoing like an enormous amount of work. And collectively, we are recomputing vast amounts of, of information that um, we already know the answer to. Like we know what the binary of Acme Lib is. The bi it, like it's not. There's nothing new happening there. But we can't trust. Uh, we can't trust someone else to give us that binary without you know exposing a huge vulnerability in our applications. So we recompile. So so programming languages stand to benefit enormously from zero knowledge because this allows us to have you know this kind of these provenance chain of custody questions around software dependencies. And allows if we can produce proofs of compilation, we will then be able to have secure, decentralized uh, distribution of binaries, mm -hmm. uh, which will make software development much faster um, and more efficient. You know, the it, it will allow us to have more um, computationally involved compu compilation because you know one of the criticisms of Rust, for example, is that Rust the Rust compiler is too slow. The Rust compiler does too much work. Right, because when we're writing software, we want you know we want to hit enter and we want the the compi we want compilation to happen instantly. We we mm -hmm. have so you have like you know maybe a few seconds of work that you can do um, before your 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 user the programmer gets upset with you, um, and so consequently right like compilers can only be so complicated right, which means that they you know. Uh, computers had to get really powerful before we could do things like certain kinds of, of static analysis, right? Like, you know, uh, I don't, you know, there, there. I think there's, there's a, a good reason why something like, you know, Rust wasn't, you know, um, uh, popularized in like the '90s, right? Mm -hmm. Because like we just, it would have just been too expensive, right? Computationally to do like right. all, all of the different, you know, transformations and 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 checks that that Rust has to do, um, but. Um, so, so we're going to have languages that are uh, that are more expressive, more featureful. We're going to have um, you know uh, more secure like um, uh, chain of custody for 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 dependencies, um, uh, supply chain attacks, which is a really increasing problem. Um, and we'll also have again the same kind of of zero knowledge certification of the properties of programs because. You know, you really don't want to run an application that has like a Bitcoin miner in it, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so people, I think what will happen is it, it will be a, a norm when you publish software, when among the various properties that you want to certify to your users, you'll want to certify this piece of software does not contain a cryptocurrency miner. We are not stealing your <laughs> right. computational capacity uh, for our own gain. Right. Um, and... Um, and that's just build systems. That's just build compilers and build systems. Like when it comes to type checking, you know, there's, there's crazy stuff that we can do because, like, and so uh, the 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 uh, there's a division within like programming languages. There are dynamically typed languages and there are statically typed languages. Um, and statically typed languages are where you have this the compiler do all of this uh, reasoning up front about the properties of, of your program. And right. dynamic languages have, you know, uh, runtime tagging. Um, so you can have, uh, you know, reflection at runtime on, like, what the state of... So, so with statically typed languages, we do a lot of work up front, and then we throw information away. Um, and that lets us be very efficient, right? We get to do a lot of transformations. You know, we get to, like... Lift lambdas. We get to do all sorts of, you know, inlining and and um, you know the Haskell compiler is is you know uh, just a tour de force on this. There's like magical things that it can do. Um, but the the the, the trade-off is that like if uh, I one I have to have like the Haskell runtime, which is you know non-trivial, and two um, I can't just like pause dynamically a Haskell program in the same way that I could pause like a you know a Lisp program or a Python program. Um, or JavaScript, and like get like some something like intelligible, some like blob that like I could actually read and understand. Like in Python, you know, like a string is an object with the label string, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. it's it's uh, and so this is why like statically typed, um, uh, you know, programmers describe uh, uh, dynamic typing sort of derisively as, oh, it's just unityping. Everything is just, you know, one type. Because from the statically typed perspective, that's true. Um, but dynamic typing is, is, you know, very, very powerful and very popular because, you know, 
the, the, a dynamic, a dynamic uh, uh, programmer of a dynamically typed language might say, well, you know, the real world exists. We have to actually do things. We, right? Like, we can't just, you can't just do pure computation up front. Like, you actually do have a running system. You have a server running somewhere that you do have to, have to actually reflect on. And it's nice to have these tags. It gives us some backstop. And then right, there's, right. like, a whole bunch of systems that allow statically typed languages to do that reflection and allow dynamically typed languages to do upfront checking. So it's not like this, this sharp... Um, uh, boundary, it's a little fuzzy. What zero-knowledge proofs allow us to do, um, I think, is by compressing uh, those um, uh, static properties of, um, of programs into succinct uh, certificates, um, we allow, we will allow uh, a kind of, of dynamic static typing where uh, you know, you're, you're, you'll have a unit type, you'll have like a string, you know, Python style, like object, right? Or, you know, the Haskell dynamic type class, right? Like you can, you can turn GHC into Python, you know, uh, with, with, you know, a little, a little prodding. Um, it won't be like a, the tag string. It will be the tag string plus a, a zero knowledge proof that the, uh, that the contents of this object actually statically uh, were type checked by GHC and that, mm -hmm. the, and, and therefore, you can fearlessly coerce that dynamic information back into a static, uh, statically typed, um, uh, you know, uh, object or, or data type, um, you know, on the other side of like, you know, uh, an FFI boundary or, you know, uh, a, a uh, on the other side of like a network connection, right? Because like when we want to communicate like over the, over like through FFI or over the network, we have to do like marshalling. We have to, we have to serialize our data into some form that like we can create packets. Like, and I send you my packets and you have to reconstitute it on the other side. And like with, with Haskell, right? Like, you accept stuff, you know, through like uh, through I/O, right? And then you have to do like some parsing or you some validation mm -hmm. to make sure that like the packets that I sent you weren't junk. And not because like I'm trying to like attack you, but maybe like packets packets can just get dropped, right? right. Like um, you know, you you can have like just just ordinary you know things that can go wrong. Um, but if you have a proof, right, that the the bits that I sent you really were like a string. Then you don't have to do that checking. I've done the checking. I have a proof that I've done the checking. Right, right. Uh, we it have a hash of the bits. Trust to become a datum. Yes, exactly, exactly. So you do, you don't have to comprehend right the the uh, structure of the string. You have you have assurance. It's a string reconstitute. And so now static typing becomes really as like um, uh, expressive as dynamic typing for this purpose. And sure. and equivalently, dynamic types can now encode. Uh, arbitrary static properties, and so uh, I think um, I think it's gonna it's gonna be a, a complete revolution in the way that um, we uh, think about the the design and implementation of programming languages. Right. You know. Uh, and among, you know, with yeah. respect to blockchain, to kind of summarize some things that we've said already, block what zk is allowing you to do for blockchain is you get to substitute work for the mere act of verification. Right. And so type checking is a kind of work that you would love to see happen on your contracts, but now you're removing the gas cost. You're removing the compute cost. You're removing the replication cost. You're making it now economically the right choice because it's simply a more valuable bytecode if that bytecode can show that it adheres to a certain specification, kind of like what you were saying with standards. In a right. way, standards are a kind of type. They're a kind of type on a space of implementations, and you want to show that in a particular implementation inhabits that type. And that's basically what site static type checkers do as well. And so by, uh, by ZK giving us this magical lever where we get to move computations out of the blockchain, suddenly a whole ton of, thung, a whole ton of things become economically viable right. that give better results, better answers, better utility, but without having to compromise. Right. Right, and and this is this is I think the direction you know this gets us back to where we started with the, talking about you know what um, how this is going to implement uh, Im how this is going to to impact uh, um, uh, blockchains and the 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 future of this space. I think you know what will happen is that the um, the chains of the future are going to be very scalable, very um, you know low gas cost chains that are you know uh, that that. 
but really like the transactions that we have on them, the, most of the, of the things that we verify on chain are going to be proofs of some other uh, compute that was happening elsewhere. And mm -hmm. um, the base layer functionality of the, um, excuse me, of the chain is, um, is just going to be uh, used to uh, support uh, that like proof verification. Like, like you're not going to, you're not going to do like expensive work in the state machine, the base layer state machine, right, because right. like y you can do it like for, for a thousand X, maybe a million X more, more cheaply um, right. within, within a proof. Um, and so it becomes a backbone at that. Right. Right. And with respect to, to programming languages, um, what we get out of this is uh, a, uh, a, a genericity because now we don't have to bake in a specific programming paradigm into our um, into our base layer, right? Into into the blockchain. So um, a lot of the, the 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 discourse around like smart contract languages has been like this tension between like, well, you really have to commit to like a very specific language, right? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. you 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 I mean, you could you can imagine you know having like. A, 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 I don't know if there are any blockchains that have like multiple, like actually have multiple execution environments. I know that Ethereum at one point wanted to have like, you know, EVM plus WASM, but this never, this, this never really worked because like there's a lot of questions around then around how like you, you go from one execution environment to another. You, you really are very limited. Like, so, so a lot of um, blockchain um, engineering turns into a, almost a kind of bike shedding around like programming language design of the smart contract language. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And because this is the thing that users interact with. And so like, like, and the amount of like spilled ink over like solidity being a bad language is just like mind blowing. I mean, literally like you talk to basically anyone in Ethereum and, and you say like, Oh, solidity. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's too bad we have to write in Solidity. It's such a terrible language. And the people that write Solidity every day and make big bucks are like, yeah, man, it's you know horrible language. Like you know, you know, it, it's like this. This um, no one can switch away from it, right? Because it's so like uh, it. It has it, it's so enmeshed in like in Ethereum, and there's such you know uh, you know momentum and such exciting things happening like in blockchain that like. Uh, to to imagine switching away to, to to something that's maybe better or maybe more suitable for for um, uh, writing smart contracts like Pact or you know Move or you know uh, I think there are some Wasm uh, based systems that are pretty exciting um, that switching cost is just really high but with proofs we can we can have you know happy coexistence of all mm. these different uh, because it doesn't you don't the base layer doesn't need to support um, an EVM interpreter. And a right. move interpreter and a packed interpreter. All we right. need to do is have off-chain infrastructure that's able to create zero knowledge proofs of packed interpretation. Right. Of packed interpretation, of move interpretation, of WASM interpretation, eventually of EVM interpretation. Um, and this is this is directly what we are building at, at Lurk Lab. This is like mm -hmm. that's that's the, the point uh, of of uh, you know where where you know our unique value prop comes in, I think. Well, John, thank you. You've done a very good, uh, very good job of painting a picture of ZK as a doorway into a rather bright future. So I'm very excited to see where we go with that. And uh, I want to thank you for coming on this, uh, this, um, I don't know what you call this, this episode, this episode with me to talk about ZK. Absolutely. My pleasure.